Hello and welcome to this video on sociological research methods. To recap from last week, theories are sets of ideas that explain reality. But in order to explain reality, you have to collect really good data about reality. The question that we're going to look at today is how do you collect good data? Remember, if your data sucks, your theory sucks because it won't explain reality very well. We looked at three theoretical perspectives last week, structural functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interaction. Each of these sets of theories has been built over centuries, literally, since the, since the middle part of the, the 1800s, um, and, and their philosophical foundations go back to before then based on close observations of reality, collecting data, interpreting it, and using these theoretical perspectives to explain what is going on. So how do we collect good data? If you haven't already, read the parable of the blind man and the elephant. This is an old uh, Buddhist parable that explains how we understand reality, maybe individually, and how we understand reality together, how we make sense of and create shared reality. There are five questions on that sheet. Answer them and turn them in um, by the end of the week, by your due date for your next quiz. And if you're coming to class this Thursday, we'll talk about the parable for the first thing in class, but it'll really help you start to think about how we collect data to explain reality. The scientific method is something that all of you have heard of before. If you want to collect good data about reality to explain it, you need to more or less follow these steps. The scientific method allows us to see more than one side of a thing and thus to approximate, to develop a good theory of social phenomena. This is a systematic way of asking questions, gathering data, analyzing data, and talking about our findings regarding social phenomena. Remember that sociology is not just the study of society and the individual and the relationship between the two, but it's a systematic scientific way to go about studying the social world. You have to have some sort of question, a research question. Usually this poses relationships between variables, which we'll talk about in a moment. Whenever you have a question about the social world, you need to understand the context in which that question is being asked. Uh, in formal terms, if you're writing a paper, you need to conduct a literature review and go see what other scholars, what other research has shown about that question and related questions. So there's sort of this saying that um, all, all, all of us stand on the, you know, if, you, if you do something great, or even if you don't, like you know, me, I don't think I do anything great, but we stand on the shoulders of giants. That means that nothing that we're doing is in a vacuum. None of our research, none of our research questions exist in a vacuum. We didn't come up with them just out of our own heads. Other people have asked the same kinds of questions. Other people have done relevant work. And we need to be familiar with the context, the social context, the political, historical context, the academic context of these questions, of our variables, before we really dig into it. You've got to approach this systematically. Um, especially in more experimental and more experimental methodologies or more quantitative methodologies, um, you're, you're, you want to develop formal hypotheses and, and really define what it is that you're looking for. Define what it is that you're measuring. Um, you want to choose a research method, a design or method. So are you going to study the social phenomenon by giving a survey? Are you going to do it? observations? Are you going to interview people? Are you going to do a laboratory experiment? We'll go through some of these methods today and they have their different uses. They have their different strengths and weaknesses. Not all research methods are best suited to all questions. Depending on how you ask a question, that might drive what kind of method you use to collect data about that question. So you're going to collect the data. You're going to analyze the data. That is, you're going to look for patterns in the data. You're going to do statistical analyses if you're doing a quantitative study. You're going to do coding if you're doing a qualitative study. Um, and then you're going to disseminate your findings. And what that means is you're going to tell other people what you found. In academia, that is generally writing a paper, presenting at a conference, 
crucially going through peer review. So in science, all findings are provisional and subject to revision. What that means is that when you find something, it doesn't just mean it's true. It doesn't become a fact. Uh, it means that you have, fa you have found usually a, a suggestion or evidence, some evidence that something is true or some evidence of a relationship. It doesn't mean that you found something that is 100% true all the time. Um, other people, other scholars, other experts need to take a look at what you did and, um, and critique it. Science progresses through critique, through us critiquing one another's work in, in the process of peer review. We'll explain more about that later as well. But this is the, these are the basic steps of the, of the scientific method. And you need to kind of go through all of these systematically to make sure that you're asking a good question, that you understand what you're looking for, that you're collecting and analyzing data, and you're trying to do this as objectively as possible in most cases. Um, and you're disseminating your findings, you're making sure that it gets peer reviewed, um, that you don't, you don't just say that this is right without letting anybody look at it. You, you know, referring back to the literature view, I like this meme, um, you always need to, to contextualize what you're looking for, right? You, you need to look at peer reviewed scientific literature. A lot of people, and this is especially true with the proliferation of social media, um, and the ability for, for any of us to kind of create information and disseminate information by making a, a YouTube video or whatever it is, you know these people. They cite a Netflix documentary, some random thing, and they say, this is evidence that, you know, what I think is right, but there's nothing else there, right? They just looked at one documentary and think they did research. They haven't done research. They watched a documentary or a YouTube video. Um, I know people that do this all the time. Oh, this YouTube video, this guy with 1,000 viewers who lives in the woods by himself, you know, and didn't graduate high school, says this, and this is what I believe. But all the other scientists are all wrong, right? This is utter nonsense. You need to conduct research, not research. So know the difference between the two. Um, regarding, again, disseminating your findings, it's okay to be wrong in science. Like I said, science progresses through critique. Science progresses through error. When you measure relationships between things, you measure variables, you look at the social world, of course, getting it right is nice and useful and helps steer us in the right direction, but getting things wrong is useful too. When you find that, in fact, there is no relationship between two variables, that's useful because then we know what isn't true and people won't re reproduce that study or redo that, but we know that that's not the case. So I like this little alien comic. I have attempted science. Please explain. I formed an idea and then I discovered I was wrong. Uh, I was wrong in numerous ways. I produced a detailed tribute to my wrongness. That is science. And I love that kind of funny definition of science that science is a detailed tribute to our wrongness. This is true. Error is useful. Error is how science gets closer to truth. It allows us to develop better theories. And we have to be able to admit error some people are not good at this, but the institution of science is organized such that error is, 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 is identifiable, is critiquable, error is publishable, and we should be able to correct our errors and to proceed in more fruitful directions to approach better theories about reality. So one sort of overarching concept when we're thinking about research methods is variables. Uh, most research has variables. Most research is looking at relationships among variables. We're looking at how one thing impacts another thing, or usually it's much more complex. You're looking at the interactions of 10 different things um, and it gets, it gets really difficult. And so you've got to have really, really good research methods and a good understanding of all the stuff to be able to do this well. But a variable is simply a factor that changes or is changed by another factor. So variables affect one another. There are two types of variables. I know you've heard of these before. Independent variables are predicted to cause change. Researchers often manipulate or control for independent variables. Um, and dependent variables are changed by the independent variable. Another way to put this is independent variables are not changed, right? They're independent. 
they change independently of other variables. Dependent variables depend on independent variables. Their change depends on changes in the independent variable. So my example here, what is the relationship between studying and test scores? That's a good research question. It's assuming there's some sort of relationship. So we're, we're gonna see if there's a relationship and then if there is, what it is. What is the relationship between studying and test scores? What is the independent variable? Actually, what are the two variables in that question? Got it? Studying and test scores. You're trying to find the relationship between two things. Those are the variables, the two things that, that might affect one another. Um, which one is independent? Think about it. If you said studying, you are correct. Why? Because our hypothesis here, and the question is sort of suggesting, uh, well, the question is not suggesting, but if you think about it, it has what's called face validity. It makes sense on the face of it. That studying affects test scores. Let's say, let's hypothesize that the more you study, the higher your test scores. And the, low, the less you study, the lower your test scores. And this is generally true. It's not always true, but there's a really strong correlation and a causal relationship between studying and test scores. The more you study, usually the better your test scores. So a change in the amount of studying causes a change in the amount of test scores. If I study more, then my test scores are, are likely to improve. That means test scores are the dependent variable, right? Test scores depend on how much you study. They depend on the independent variable. Fantastic, right? Easy. So dependent and independent variables are important to understand. Another thing that is important to understand when you're thinking about research methods and when you are consuming research, that is when you are reading it, whether it is scientific research or whether it is just some nonsense you see in the news, is the difference between causation and correlation. Rigorously following the scientific method helps us not confuse the two, helps us not confuse uh, correlation for causation. It helps us understand the difference between the two and make sure that we get it right. So in a causal relationship, one variable causes another. A causes B, right? Studying causes test scores, right? Studying more causes higher test scores. There's, there's a really tight correlation, um, a tight causal relationship. And I keep saying that there's a, there's a tight correlation because a correlation simply means that two variables move together. Um, so as A increases, B also increases, or as A increases, B decreases at the same amount. There's some visible pattern of relationship. So studying in test scores, is causal because studying causes test scores to change. And it is also a correlation because as studying increases, test scores generally increase too. And I say it's a tight correlation because uh, it's, it's, you can observe this over and over and over and pretty much all the time with most populations and most people, almost every time you do it, uh, studying increases test scores, right? So it's, it's tight, it's not weak. Um, so the more you study, like every like 50% of the chance, 50% of the time you get better test scores. No, it's like the more you study, like most of the time you get better test scores. So it's a tight correlation. Um, but here's, here's an example of the saying, correlation does not imply causation. That is just because two variables increase or decrease together, it doesn't mean that one causes the other. My example ice cream sales and murder rates. These two variables are positively correlated, positively meaning that as one increases, the other increases. If I said negatively correlated, it means as one decreases, the other decreases. Uh, it means as, as one goes one way, the other goes the other way. So as ice cream sales increase, the murder rate increases. How to explain this? And this is true, I'm not making this up. As ice cream sales increase, the murder rate increases. Which one is the independent variable? Which one's the dependent variable? Not really sure. I don't, I don't really understand how one could cause the other. If you think about it, though, you realize that this makes no sense. There's no way that I can think of 
that increasing ice cream sales causes murder rates. Like murderers really like to eat ice cream before they kill people. Or after you kill somebody, you like an ice cream cone to just, you know, settle down and reflect on what you just did. I don't know. The answer here is that this is a spurious correlation. Uh, the variables appear causal, but they really aren't. They're co correlated only and there's zero causation. In fact, in this case, there's what's called an intervening variable, which is the, uh, the, the season, the time of year. The intervening variable explains the relationship. So in the summer, ice cream sales increase, right? The, the season causes ice cream sales to increase. Why? It's hot, people like ice cream, the ice cream trucks come out. Actually, you know, it's funny, at my, my girlfriend's house, there's an ice cream truck, and that thing runs year round. I just, I just was on a walk like last week, it was like 40 degrees outside, and I started hearing the, you know, the music, Hello, this ice cream truck music. And I was like, seriously, it's like 40 degrees outside and cloudy. Lo and behold, I found the ice cream truck and there were just like kids come from everywhere. So even though it was cold, the ice cream truck was still around. People were still selling ice cream and buying ice cream. But in the summer, ice cream sales increase. Uh, in the summer, crime also increases. Why? We can put on our sociological imagination hats for a minute. Um, who commits uh, a lot of crime? What age group? People who are your age, teenagers, college age, people, young adults, right? Teenagers and young adults. Um, in the summer, what are these people not doing that they're doing most of the rest of the year? That's right, they're not in school, so they can be up to more trouble. Um, so in the summer, crime increases because all of the country's teenagers and uh, young adults, not all of them, but many of them are out of school and they have more free time and they can, they can get up to doing whatever they're doing. So there's no relationship actually between ice cream sales and crime, but the season is actually an intervening, intervening variable that explains uh, the apparent relationship between those two other variables. You have to watch out for spurious correlations. They're everywhere. And your mind will see a connection between two things and you will think that they are causal, but they are not. You have to be um, vigilant about looking out for spurious correlations. You can see this, I forget what website this comes from. Um, anyway, if you Google like spurious correlations, you can find all sorts of examples that are funny. But uh, this, these, these two, these two, for example, they're tightly correlated, right? As one variable increases and decreases, the other one does exactly the same thing. They, they, they increase and decrease together. U.S. spending on science, space, and technology is strongly correlated with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Does U.S. spending on science, space, and technology cause more suicides? No, that doesn't make any sense. There are all sorts of intervening variables and other ways to explain this. They just happen to correlate if you plot them together like this. Um, another one is the number of people who drown by falling in a pool strongly correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. If this was causal and we wanted to stop drownings, we would prevent Nicolas Cage from making any more movies and drownings would go down. But obviously this doesn't make any sense and these are not actually related. This is a spurious correlation and they just happen to line up together. But there are a lot of real life spurious correlations that people take for causation that are much more serious than, well, both of these have to do with death and suicide. That's pretty serious, but that aren't, that aren't just kind of silly ones like this. One is um, the MMR vaccine or vaccines and autism. This is a spurious correlation. There are many, many, many reasons all contributing to why autism rates have increased in the last couple decades, in the last few decades. Um, one intervening variable is the expansion of the definition of autism. It's now autism spectrum disorder. Autism has also become more publicly known. There's much more awareness about autism. Uh, schools have 
uh, expanded special education programs, not expanded them, but um, allowed more children with autism to come into the educational setting, whether it's in special education classrooms or to be mainstreamed. There's been all sorts of movements on this. So uh, people with autism are much more visible. People with autism have much better life expectancies than in before than before because autism is much more understood as as a condition and people with autism are more accepted in society than in the past although there's still a lot of discrimination and misunderstanding about people with autism environmental toxins which are more common now than ever biological and genetic vulnerability and variability various disorders or diseases within a mother and infant along with who knows how many other potential variables all contribute to a rise in autism. Simply explaining autism with vaccines is spurious, right? They may appear to be correlated, but there are a lot of other things that correlate with autism, including cell phone use, Jenny McCarthy's fame, and Jenny McCarthy is an outspoken anti-vaxxer, uh, but as she rose to prominence, uh, autism rates increased so maybe she caused it obviously that doesn't make any sense it's another spurious correlation and organic food sales have also increased right alongside at the same rate as uh, new cases of autism and have organic food sales increased autism probably not there are many many contributing factors but it's easy to see especially with a a well-funded campaign behind it um, it's easy to see that um, autism and vaccines are, are correlated but it's not a causal relationship um, if you if you want to dig into the history of this one it's really interesting um, there's a, a researcher named andrew wakefield he published a paper in 1998 in the lancet that started the vaccine autism controversy you can actually read all about this it's utterly fascinating um, the guy did this study um, that wound up having really bad research methods which is important for learning about research methods because you need to be able to read papers and understand why research methods are bad. His sample size was small. Um, there were all sorts of issues with the with the study, but it, it sparked this whole kind of movement on, on vaccines and autism. He actually had uh, his study funded with uh, money that turned out to be conflictual, as in he was being paid by people or funded by people who had a stake in making this connection. Um, it's really interesting. Go read about Andrew Wakefield and the beginning of the autism vaccine controversy, but that is another spurious correlation. Um, there's another one that's pretty interesting to think about causation and correlation. In is a historical example. In World War I, um, at the beginning of World War I, British soldiers' uniforms included a cloth cap, right? They wore this cloth cap, but no helmet. It wasn't a metal helmet. As the war progressed, the British War Office became alarmed at the number of head injuries and decided to replace the cloth headgear with more protective metal helmets. But once the War Office did this, they soon discovered that after the introduction of metal helmets, the incidence of head injuries increased, which is not what you would expect, right? They thought that the cloth helmets were causing more head injuries because they were cloth and not metal. But when they introduced metal helmets, head injuries actually went up. How is that possible? This is a little riddle for, ca for causation and, and correlation. You can think about it for a second. Right? Now the answer, which they eventually stumbled upon and figured out, um, and they continued using metal helmets because they're safer. The answer is that if you're shot in the head, and you're wearing a cloth helmet, what happens to you? You likely just die. And yeah, there's a there was a high incidence of head injuries, but when you move to a metal helmet and you get shot in the head, what happens to you? You're less likely to die than if you had a cloth helmet because the helmet will, will protect you more, but you're more likely instead of dying to sustain a head injury. So head injuries go up, but deaths go down. So th this is the answer to that little riddle um, but if you just look at it on the face of it, you might assume that if you're only looking at head injuries, that metal helmets are more dangerous than cloth helmets, which they're not. But you, you, gotta have to, you kind of have to dig into it a little bit and figure out um, why that's the case. So when you're thinking about 
sociological research, you've got your research question, you're trying to decide how to study the question. There are two major kinds of research methods that exist, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative methods think quality, like the essence of a thing. These kinds of studies are often conducted in natural settings. They produce in-depth or descriptive information. They produce words and text. They usually have small sample sizes. Uh, they're tough to generalize, which is a weakness, but you get really good insight into people's lives, their experiences, and their issues, which is a strength. Different qualitative methods include in-depth interviews, observations, ethnographies, which is a, a kind of um, larger methodology where you study people in, in a natural setting, sort of doing what they do in, a, in their daily life. So that's qualitative. Quantitative methods, think quantity, like amount, like numbers. This is the collection and analysis of numerical data, using statistics oftentimes to determine causal relationships. A strength of quantitative methods is that they have large sample sizes and good generalizability, which means your findings are widely applicable to a large group of people. But the weakness is that they have poor insight into people's lives, everyday experiences, and issues. Right? You're not getting text. Instead, people are reporting these sorts of things in, in numerical form, and that doesn't really tell you what they think as well as if you just ask them and collect verbal data. So they each have their strengths and weaknesses, and different questions may be best explored using different kinds of quantitative and or qualitative methods. You can certainly use both. This might be called a mixed methods approach. Some considerations when you're thinking about research methods um, and this is regardless of what kind of research you're doing, you want to think about the target population. So when you ask a question, let's say we're, we're doing our studying and test scores question. So does studying, uh, what's the relationship between studying and test scores? Um, who, who am I answering this question about? Am I talking about all students in the world? Probably not. Um, if I'm doing this survey at GGC, I'm, say, let's say I give out a survey and when I ask you like how many hours you study and what your grades usually are or something like this, my target population might be GGC students. So I'm trying to say something about, I'm, I'm saying that my findings are, are generalizable or valid for GGC students. The sample is the part of the population that I'll actually talk to. I'm not going to give the survey to every single GGC student. I'm only going to give it to you know a, a much smaller number than the than the population, and I'll be able to generalize, hopefully, my findings to the population based on my good sample. Your sample should usually be you should try to make it representative, although it's not always going to be like that, and that's okay. But you need to understand that that's a weakness, and that you know you need to understand how to how to talk about it, kind of why it's a weakness, and what you can do about it. Um, but a representative sample would mean, for example, if I'm asking that question, what is the relationship between studying and test scores, and I'm looking at GGC students, I want to look at what the GGC student body looks like, right, in terms of race, in terms of gender, uh, maybe in terms of how many people who lives on campus and who doesn't, and the sample should be like that. So I can't, I can't give my survey to 90% um, Hispanic students and say that my results are generalizable to the entire student body because the entire student body is not 90% Hispanic, right? It's like 20 or 30 something percent Hispanic. Um, so I, I would need to, to change the numbers of different racial or ethnic groups in my sample to have it more representative. Okay, so think about why you would use one method over the other. You want to make sure that you address the, the weaknesses and strengths of your method in terms of explaining why you chose it. So you can come up with your own research question and think about how you would gather data for it. What's your research question? And what is maybe the best way or what's a really good way? How can you justify collecting data in a certain kind of way? All right. Now let's look at a couple types of qualitative research. This is by sociology humor, right? Sitting outside the sociology department, 
I love our lunches out here, but I always get the feeling that we're being watched. Well, sociologists are known for doing qualitative research, quantitative as well, but are known for doing observations. Um, so they're, they're perhaps those people are being observed out there. Uh, people are watching how they pick me. A little sociology humor. Um, another kind of qualitative, or a kind of observation that people do is called non-participant observation. Another kind is participant observation, but in a non-participant observation, the researcher observes what people are doing without participating in the activity itself. So my research is on understanding how people learn to play video games. This is my like kind of overarching research question. It's driven my career. Most of what I publish has to do with this, has to do something with how people play video games. Um, and one way that I have studied this is through non-participant observation. So I've had people come into a lab or an office with computers set up, and I've had them play video games together. And I have sat, from the perspective of me taking this picture, I sat there and watched them. I take notes, we call these field notes. Um, I have a microphone, which you can't see in this picture, recording everything they say. And I have a piece of software running on each computer recording everything that they do. So I have all this useful data um, of their in-game video play, of their talking together, and of me writing field notes, observing you know, physically what they're doing. And all that data really leads to um, a, a rich set of information from which to draw conclusions about how they are learning to play, how they are playing together, so on and so forth. So that's, that's fun. You can do this with participant observation as well. Some other research that I've done involves um, trying to do sociological analyses of how large groups of people come together in virtual worlds to accomplish shared goals. If you're familiar with video games or massively multiplayer online games, um, or now you have shooters that are like this as well, like Destiny or something. This is World of Warcraft, which I've studied extensively. Uh, in the previous slide, if you're curious, they were playing Port, which my dissertation was on World of Warcraft and Portal 2, and I've published a lot on World of Warcraft especially. But um, to conduct this kind of participant observation, um, I joined a large group of players. I was in this group of players called the Guild for years, and I would go and play with them. And again, I would record the chat log, I would record video, and so I had all this data of us playing together, talking, interacting via our characters. Um, I, I became a member of this group. I participated in what they were doing and I observed as, as I was doing it, as we were doing it. And so I was able to explain all sorts of things about how people do this, like how you raid together, how you kill bosses together with 40 people or 25 people in a group who are all in different places all over the world, uh, communicating via headsets and text and via their characters. Really interesting stuff. When you're thinking about especially participant observation, but also ethnography, you need to think about gaining access to that group of people that you want to study. It's not always easy to gain access to a group of people. Um, you can't just walk up and be like, hey, I'm going to study you guys. Cool. Most people are not going to just let you in, right? You've got to kind of maybe befriend them. You've got to establish trust or rapport, which is an ease of communication. Um, When you're doing participant observation, you're writing field notes as well. So I was doing it, I showed you with non-participant observation, but you do it with participant observation as well. And when you're writing up your papers, right, this is qualitative research, so you're really providing an in-depth description of what's going on. But you also have to understand what's called reflexivity. This is a trap of qualitative work, especially. And reflexivity means that your subjects, your participants are aware that you're there especially if you're participating, and you can actually affect the reality that you're observing. Remember the slide last week on Schrodinger's cat and parallel universes, right? Remember, uh, once you open the backpack and you see that the cat is dead, you have killed the cat, right? You have eliminated the possibility of it being alive. You have changed the reality, right? You've confirmed the status of that cat in the same kind of way. Um, I'll give you an example. When, um, when I was doing research 
this, this non-participant observation research in World of Warcraft, this particular study, I had a participant uh, who cheated. He cheated in the game. And this was really interesting to me because they were supposed to be playing the game as they normally would, or like just, just trying to play play the game, and I would sit and watch them. But I, I left for a while one time, and I, and I came back, and he was still in the office playing. And when I came back, he like was like minimizing tabs, like as if he, I, did, I shouldn't see something that he was doing. And I was just sort of like, everything okay? What's going on? He's like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm just like doing this quest. And I was like, okay. And I sat down and I, you know, started talking to him and taking my notes and whatever I was doing. And like 10 minutes later, he says, David, I've, I've got to confess something. And I said, what? And he said, I was looking up cheats. Like I was, I was looking up answers. I was looking up like how to do this quest. I was cheating. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I, I wanted to know how people played video games. And how he plays video games is by using walkthroughs and using Let's Plays and stuff like that. But he thought that I would consider that cheating. And so my presence in the room with him changed how he played the game. And so I, I, I changed social reality, right? My presence changed social reality. And then it made me wonder, of course, all of my other participants. Was my presence affecting the way that they were playing? Because I had only data you know, that I could see um, in terms of how they were playing the game. And so if I was drawing conclusions like this is how people learn to play games and nobody was like looking at walkthroughs or anything, then I'm not going to consider that. But what if they only weren't looking at walkthroughs because I was there? My data are messed up. And so I had to sort of like consider that and go back and talk to all my participants and see if this is what they were doing or if they usually did it. It, it was really interesting and very eye-opening for me at the time as a graduate student um, to sort of realize this, that understanding reflexivity in qualitative work is really important. Um, oh, and to think about gaining access, just my note here, um, it's not always easy to gain access, especially for organizations that have gatekeepers. So there are not studies on you know, Fortune 500 CEOs. These people are rich and powerful and they don't want you to study them and very few people are able to do that. Um, there's a book called Gang Leader for a Day, which is really interesting. It's an ethnography of gangs in Chicago. Um, the researcher had a hard time gaining access to this population because they're involved in crime and all sorts of things. They had to trust him, uh, but he wound up doing it. Um, and they made him leader for a day or something kind of silly. But that's where the book title came from. But it's really interesting. Um, anyway, ethnography is what the gang leader for, for a day guy did. There's this book down there. Um, and you can see Nickel and Dined and Wheeling and Dealing. Wheeling and Dealing is a really interesting book. It's an ethnography of an upper level drug dealing and smuggling community. So these, you know, middle, upper middle class sociologists, a husband and wife actually, moved and they realized that they had moved next door to people who were kind of leading a cocaine smuggling ring. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. What a good opportunity for research, which is probably not what I would think, but that's what they thought. And sure enough, they gained access to the drug smuggling ring, the drug dealing ring. They established rapport and they did this ethnography on cocaine dealing, which is really unique, a unique piece of work. So they study people, and this is what an ethnographer does, they study people in their own environment to understand what they do and how they live. A lot of anthropological work is ethnographic. You go into the field, you do field work. You might live with a group of people. We discussed uh, Tobias Schneebaum, the New York artist who went to Peru and lived with a tribe of cannibals. He came back and wrote this book, Keep the River on Your Right. This book was an ethnography uh, detailing how these people lived he lived with them for nine months, right? He observed them, he did interviews with them, talked to them. Um, he wasn't setting out to study them, but he wound up doing that by virtue of being a member of their group. So ethnographies are really cool. I have a friend, uh, his name is Hiram, it's the guy on the left. He is a linguist and he studies, he, he, he does lang what's called language documentation. He writes down, he did this with this one group called the Panar in India. Um, he, he wrote their language down. It was his PhD dissertation. Panar was a, an oral language, uh, it was not written. It didn't have a, a written grammar or anything like that. And it was a threatened and dying language being kind of taken over by Hindi, uh, which was, is, is 
perhaps eventually going to take over all the other languages in India. You know, languages do this, right? As languages influence expands, it takes over other languages that are local or native and just sort of consumes them. Um, English and Spanish have done that in North America um, and taken over, sort of eaten up um, native languages, native, native Americans languages. Um, so this, this happens. Linguists actually estimate that about half of the world's 7,000 languages will be extinct by the year 2100 because of this phenomenon. So what Hiram does is writes this language down to keep it alive. He used to go every summer and live with these people for three months every summer, um, learning their language, talking with the people, you know, farming with them, praying with them, um, and, and writing their language. And so that, that's an example of ethnography. It's a really good example of ethnography. So again, sociology humor, this would be a, an ethnographer, right? Going and living or following barbarians around, two barbarians and a professor, more accurately an anthropologist or a sociologist um, who does barbarian studies. Some types of quantitative research. That was all qualitative, right? You're interviewing, you're observing, you're producing text and in-depth data that really explores people's lived experiences. Quantitative research doesn't do that. Um, it produces good data through numbers and statistics. Surveys are usually quantitative. You can have qualitative surveys. So if you ask a survey question that is open-ended, for example, that could be qualitative. Um, but most surveys that you take, what do you do? You circle yes or no, or one, two, three, four, five, or something like that. It's quantifying your answer. It's putting it in a numerical form. Um, think about surveys, um, and you can apply this to interviews as well, to some extent. But there are two main types of questions, closed-ended questions and open-ended questions. Closed-ended questions limit the answer. So a yes or no question is a closed-ended question. Um, you know, do you like the food on campus? Yes or no? It doesn't allow you to say anything else. An open-ended question allows the respondent to elaborate. Um, do you like the food on campus? Yes or no? Uh, why? And then that person can say whatever they want. So you can see the difference between closed-ended and open-ended. Um, you want to avoid bad questions. Two types of bad questions are double-barreled questions and leading questions. Double-barreled questions ask multiple things at once. It seems like one question, but it's really like two or three questions. And so that can be really confusing for the person who's trying to answer. And then when you're trying to analyze the data, you may not be sure what exactly they answered, and you may not be sure how to analyze that data. So if I said, do you like the food on campus? Or what do you like about the food on campus? And how do you think about the parking on campus? Uh, they may choose to answer one of those two questions, or it may be confusing. You want to avoid asking two questions in one. Leading questions kind of suggest that there is a correct answer to a question. Um, so if I said, uh, the food on campus is good, do you agree? You are being led to agree because A, I've said that it's good, and B, I've asked you if you agree. I didn't ask you if you disagreed. I said, the food on campus is good. Do you agree? Um, you will be led to say, eh, yeah. If you're on the fence, you'll be more likely to say yes. You'll be less likely to say no. That's a leading question. It introduces bias. If you have a leading question or double-barreled question, your data are affected. Right? It affects the answers people give, which gives you worse data, which gives you worse conclusions, which means your explanation, your conclusions are not very good. So you want to avoid these kinds of things. Here's an example. Um, when you come to class, uh, I'll have more for you this week. But this is, uh, this is the 2016, this is a bit old, 2016 Republican platform survey. Do you understand, if you understand how political parties how candidates for office choose their platforms. It's not just what the candidate believes or thinks. Rather, it is often based on what their constituents um, want, especially in kind of populist, populist candidates. Also, the platforms may be predetermined. And public opinion has to look like it supports the platform that the party or the candidate already has. 
even if the public disagrees with it, it has to look like they agree with it. And this is an example of the Republican survey in 2016. The Democratic survey asks the same kinds of horrible questions. Um, and when we come to class next time, I'll have examples of both. Um, but I really like this one because it has some really bad examples here. There are leading questions and bias. Um, you can look. You can look through my favorite one. I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, one of them was, "Do you agree that former President Obama's weak foreign policy leadership has confused our nation's allies and emboldened our enemies?" Well, there are multiple questions in there. It's double-barreled. What are what are the multiple questions? It's talking about weak foreign policy leadership. Uh, it's talking about confusing allies and it's talking about emboldening enemies. So two questions that you can immediately pull out of here are, um, do you agree that the foreign policy leadership has confused allies? And do you agree that it has emboldened enemies? These are two questions. If I answer this, and remember on the survey, it's a yes or no question. There's no, there's, it's not a Likert scale. So yes or no question. If I say yes to this, am I saying yes to uh, agreeing that it has confused our nation's allies and that it has emboldened our enemies? What if I think that it's confused our allies but not emboldened our enemies? What do I write if it's only yes or no? Um, note the emotion words here. Uh, weak foreign policy leadership, confused our nation's allies, emboldened our enemies. Um, these particular sorts of verbs or adjectives um, are, are matters of subjectivity as well. So it's telling you in the question that he has a weak foreign policy leadership. So if you answer the question, you're sort of like have to agree with that, with that interpretation or that assumption. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really bad question. Um, but we can ask it better by giving people a choice of how to answer. So this is, this is a Likert scale, one to five, one to seven, from strongly agree to agree. Um, and go back to the previous slide and look at some of the other examples for, for other bad questions in there. But at least if you ask a Likert, scale, a Likert scale type question, the respondent has the ability to sort of tailor their answer a bit more to what they think. So if it's a yes or no question, does yes mean a one, strongly agree? Or sorry, strong, a one, strongly disagree? No, sorry, if it's a yes, does it mean five, strongly agree? Or does it mean like 3.2, which is like you agree just a little bit? You have no idea of knowing in a yes or no question. With a Likert scale, at least you get some quantification, some more nuance to the answer. So if I really agree, I can say that. And if I only sort of agree, I can say 3.5 or you know 3 or 4 or something like that. So think about differences in how to ask a question that would allow your data to be different. You could also ask this in an open-ended way. Um, I'll also point out this was leading because do you agree? Um, instead of saying like, how do you feel about this statement or something like that, it lead you, do you agree? It leads you to agree. Why didn't they say, do you disagree that President Obama's? Why? Because they want you to agree with it. What happens is that because it's a leading question, it's double barreled, it's got all these sort of uh, like emotion, emotion words here, people are led to strongly agree with the statement. And when the results of the survey come back, they might show that like 97% of respondents strongly agreed that Obama had bad foreign policy leadership and that it was really bad for our, our allies and good for our enemies, right? And that might not be what people thought, really, because it was a yes or no question. You didn't know if they strongly agreed or just agreed. Um, it was a leading question. Your sample probably wasn't generalizable, so they'll tell you that 97% um, of Americans, right, trying to say that their population was Americans when they sampled maybe a thousand people in the rural Midwest, or they sampled only Republicans, or who knows. Um, but this is a way that, that data can be manipulated um, very badly uh, to mislead the public. Um, and this is, again, my point here is to point out that, uh, that all, all political parties do this. Um, I pick on my example here, um, but you can, you can find these same kinds of things for all political parties. So I really like this comic. I mean, I hate it, but I like it at the same time. That's the gist of what I want to say. Now get me some statistics to base it on. It is really easy to use research to mislead people. And this is unfortunate. Um, research is not objective, right? D data are not objective. We wish that they were, 
but there's always bias um, and it doesn't invalidate research, but we should be smart consumers of information and smart and ethical researchers and seek to reduce um, or reduce the amount of bias in our work or to at least uh, say what our biases are so that the person who's reading it understands the context of the research. This is really important stuff. But you see this all the time, and this is what political parties and candidates do. They know what they want to say. They know what platform they're going to run on. They just need data to support it. 97% of Americans agree with whatever. Well, no, they don't. They don't, right? They really do. You look for better surveys, right? Look for good national opinion polls like Gallup or the really high rated ones that ask good questions that aren't unethical. Um, they are, there are lots of them out there, and those are the ones to pay attention to. So we live in a society bombarded by information. This is a fact. Um, you are living in a time unprecedented in human history. You are subjected to more information, more advertisements, more media than anyone ever before. And you know there are kind of positives and, and definitely negatives, but there are positives to it too. Um, but one, one consequence of this is that you're bombarded with, in particular, statistics or numbers. Now, most people don't understand statistics, which is unfortunate also. I hope you take a statistics class in college. It will be one of the most important classes that you take, or a research methods class in your major, also one of the most important classes you take. It sounds really boring, um, but it's, it's super important for critical thinking. And, uh, and understanding how statistics work. Um, we often see statistics in news outlets, right? And this is, uh, this is, this is, you know, this is the number one way that we get information is through news or, or through social media. And oftentimes people reposting news or reposting something that someone said, um, usually something that somebody did some research or whatever and, and you know, said something and we just repost it and repost it. But we, we, you know, we understand that our world is a very risky place. Um, we understand that there's a lot to be afraid about, but that stuff is, is usually overblown. And oftentimes we're afraid of the wrong kinds of things. There are many things that are, you know, make sense to be afraid of, but oftentimes our fears of things don't align with the actual statistical probability of those things happening to us. Like, um, and I understand I'm saying this in the wake of an active shooter, warning at GDC, but your chance of being shot by someone is actually uh, super low. It's lower than uh, than, than a lot of things. Um, maybe you, you, you're more likely to fall off a ladder and die, for example, and get shot at school. Um, so so look, at, look at actual statistics for what you should be afraid of in terms of dying. But when you think about where we get statistics, right? The news or media, Media reports on exceptionally negative stories and statistics. Why? Because that's why we watch it, because it reports on crazy sounding stuff and scary sounding stuff. It keeps your eyes attached. It keeps your attention attached the more exaggerated or you know, scary or hyperbolic it is. This is, this is what drives media corporations to profit, right? You get people to watch, um, you sell ad revenue and you bring experts on and you get paid for all sorts of all sorts of stuff regarding people watching you. So the more scary stuff you can put on there, the more people will watch you. Statistics are usually or often used rhetorically to make an argument to blow an uncommon problem out of proportion or instill fear or misunderstanding. And then we remember, we especially remember these scary sounding statistics. And if, if no one, if they change, people don't tell us that they change for the better. Right? So if you hear some awful statistic about teenage pregnancies being really high and teenage pregnancies go down, you never hear that they go down, but you remember that they are really high and you, you continue to think that they're high. This is one of those funny, it's not funny, this is one of those things um, that people believe is true that is actually not true at all in the US. Um, statistics oftentimes will seem to reinforce or create common sense. And remember that in this class, when you learn to think sociologically, you want to challenge common sense. Sometimes common sense is right, but a lot of times it's wrong. It's just something that's repeated over and over um, by news or people in authority, um, and, and, and they're not using good data or you don't have data to think otherwise. 
the teen birth rate and youth violent crime are two really good examples. Um, this is a graph of the US teen birth rate over time from 1940 to 2018. And you can see that it has fallen precipitously since the baby boom years. That was called baby boom for a reason, right? Lots of teenagers were having babies. Um, it went, was going up in the, in the kind of 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, but then back down ever since then, right? The teen birth rate is lower than it's, as far as I know, lower than it's ever been. Um, so this notion of teenage pregnancy as an epidemic uh, is decontextualized. You see news stories about this all the time, how high the teenage birth rate is. Those are, those are not accurate, but we can ask some good sociological questions because there might be differences in, in the teen birth rate depending on social class. And this is true. Poor people uh, are more likely to be teenage parents than wealthier people. By education, and this is true, less educated people have children younger than more educated people by race uh, and, and so on. So just because the US teen birth rate, and this is looking at all the US, just because the US teen birth rate has fallen dramatically over time, doesn't mean that for some populations, the birth rate hasn't gone up. And it doesn't mean that, that teenage pregnancy isn't a problem. It just means that what we, what we usually think about the teen birth rate or teen pregnancies, that they're everywhere and happening all the time is simply not true. Um, it's one of those things that gets repeated in the media over and over, and it's a moral panic, and it's not true. Um, you also see it, you know, how many TV shows like Teen Mom and 16 and Pregnant and Unexpected and all these shows that exist that make it seem like there's so many pregnant teenagers in the U.S. Um, there's an interesting thing to say about the relationship between media um, and these sorts of phenomena as well. Um, for example, a good sociological question is what effects, what are the effects of these shows on attitudes toward teen pregnancy? There's actually research on that. Um, I don't think anything, there's nothing I don't think causal um, that shows that these TV shows change the teen pregnancy rate. I don't think there's data for that. Um, but there is data showing that it makes teen pregnancy seem more frequent that these shows make it seem more glamorous and enviable as a lifestyle because many of these teen moms, especially, they're on TV, their lives seem glamorous, they get paid to be on these shows. The people who are showcased on these shows usually have more social support than the average teen mom or teen parent. So it makes being a teen parent easier, seem easier than it is. It just, it, it, it um, distorts the reality of teen pregnancy, right? So it's interesting to think about that. The US youth violent crime rate is similar. Um, you know, people are of course always worried about crime, but crime in this country overall has fallen steadily, steadily, steadily in almost all places, almost everywhere since the 1990s, the early 1990s. There are some exceptions. And recently, I think I've been seeing reports about things upticking a little bit, but you can see the difference between the early 90s and now. It's a very huge difference. There's not a crime epidemic or anything like that. Um, but you see it again on news all the time. Scary numbers. Seems like we live in a riskier place than we do. And in fact, there are a lot of studies showing that um, the more people watch cable news, regardless of the network, the more cable news that you watch, the more you think that crime is everywhere. Why? Because news reports on crime all the time. Okay, data misrepresentation has real effects, very real effects. Um, it changes our perception or affects our perception of the world, of social organizations, of all sorts of stuff. Um, this chart, this chart was used at a, um, at a hearing, I think it's a House of Representatives hearing either Senate or House of Representatives, uh, but in Congress. It was displayed briefly and at a distance. Um, the numbers were used, wait, oh, sorry, I'm missing my, my script, I have a little bit of a script here. On the opening day of the US House of Representatives on September 29th, 2015, hearing on the funding of Planned Parenthood, a graph was displayed to make a critical point. This is common as effective communication of statistical information often occurs through graphs. Good graphs highlight and communicate the important relationships among the numbers. 
but deceptive graphs obscure or even contradict the messages from the numbers. This graph was used at this hearing and was displayed briefly and at a distance. Um, and, and my question to you is, what is the problem with this graph? Right? What is the problem with this graph? And the reason that this was successful is because it's about Planned Parenthood and we're talking about, you know, um, funding and defunding Planned Parenthood, which is related to abortions and provide abortion services and, and many other contraceptive services and female health services, reproductive services. Um, but okay, look at it. What's the problem? The problem is that the axis, the y axis is totally screwed up and these lines are not plotted correctly on the y axis. They're plotted in such a way as to demonstrate that cancer screening and prevention services, which people think are good, um, have gone way down and that abortions have gone, which many people think are bad, have gone way up. So this bad thing has overtaken this good thing uh, and that's what it looks like. But if you look at the numbers, you see that in fact, cancer screening and prevention services have, have halved over this time period um, and abortions have gone up, but abortions have gone up only barely. Um, and the number of abortions is far, far below, it's a third, the number of cancer screening and prevention services. So this abortion line should be below the cancer screening and prevention services line, and it should not look like abortions have overtaken the good things, like the things that everybody agrees are good um, from Planned Parenthood. So this data was used purposefully, misrepresented, the, da the data might be fine, um, but it was misrepresented purposefully to try and persuade the House of Representatives to defund Planned Parenthood. So this is very unethical and not okay. You, as a smart sociology student with a sociological imagination who knows how to critically assess data representation should see this now. Well, what's the next question to ask? Maybe how can we plot this better? So this is better. It's the same data, but properly graphed or better graphed. Um, you still see that you don't have, actually the x-axis is really jacked up. Um, this should start with 2006 and have more ticks for different years. But in all, this shows a correct representation between the two lines or a better representation. But we can still ask uh, a better question if better, because if you know anything about Planned Parenthood, you know that they do far more than offer abortion services and do cancer screening and prevention services. They do STD treatments, all sorts of other stuff. So this is even more properly graphed. Um, and you see that in the context of all that Planned Parenthood does, abortions are really, really low. And most of what they do is actually STI, STD testing and treatment, followed by contraception services. That's the vast majority of the services that Planned Parenthood provides. So my point in showing you this um, is to show you that misrepresentations of data are dangerous, that they are used purposefully to persuade us one way or the other on ideological issues, um, to vote for things, and so on and so forth. You want to be a critical consumer of information. My other point in showing you this is to think about how you develop your beliefs, um, whether you base them on uh, data or representations of data or people who show data to you in certain ways. Um, you need to sort of dig down and figure out why it is you believe the things you believe. And crucially, ask yourself if your reason for believing it or thinking in a particular way is based on faulty logic or faulty evidence. So in this case, if you are basing your perspective, say let's say, let's say you dislike Planned Parenthood, uh, let's say you're, you're, um, you're pro-life and you, and you dislike Planned Parenthood because they offer abortions. If you're basing your perspective of Planned Parenthood uh, or anything else on deceptive graphs or misrepresentations of data, then you're being misled and you should reevaluate why you think the way that you do. So at the very first graph, if that's why you don't like Planned Parenthood, you are wrong. If you're pro-life and anything to do with being pro-choice is something that's bad and you believe that for religious reasons or other, thing else, other reasons, that's fine. Um, you've contextualized it like this and you still hold those beliefs that are you know, outside the, the scope of this data. You have a religious belief um, that, lead, that leads you to be pro-life. Um, you have your beliefs, 
and 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 that is that is acceptable and that is fine and you can argue and you can debate um, but again if your perspective is based on that misrepresentation of data for this or any other example you need to reevaluate we socially construct risk that is we have numbers we have statistics um, we have arguments for why for why things are risky but it is really important to understand that risk is manufactured, right? Risk isn't some objective thing. It seems objective because we use statistics and numbers to assess it, but it is not. I love this picture. Uh, this was when there's a there's a I don't remember where 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 exactly this was. If it was federal or in California or somewhere, um, but there's there were public health concerns around vaping a year or so ago, and eventually this sort of movement, this anti-vaping movement, got vapes removed from some store shelves. And so the sign says, due to public health concerns, uh, this, this corporation will no longer carry vaping products, right? So no vape products because of health concerns. And that sign, in the absence of the vapes, next to an entire shelf of cigarettes, which absolutely cause cancer, right? The, the, the risk, your risk of, incre of getting cancer, especially throat, lung, mouth cancer, increases significantly as you smoke cigarettes and use other tobacco products. We know this, um, but the tobacco industry and the lobbies have, you know, spent billions and billions of dollars on advertisements and things over the years to keep this stuff in the stores. And, and to not have us think about this, right? Like, why is it that we're banning vape products but not banning cigarettes? Well, there's a lot of money in cigarettes. It's an established industry. It's very powerful. Um, there's lots of other reasons. But, but risk is socially constructed, is my point. Uh, not all equally risky things are banned. Uh, some, you know, some of the riskiest things we can do are totally allowed. Um, and, and there are reasons for that. So as a sociologist, you want to think about those things. Now it's it's really interesting then, like why we don't think about these contradictions or discrepancies, um, why we hold beliefs despite evidence suggesting otherwise. Check out these links on the PowerPoint about battling bad science. Michael Shermer has a TED talk on why people believe weird things. That he's talking about like UFOs and cults and stuff. Not cults, there are cults. UFOs and like Bigfoots and stuff like this. Um, not that these things don't exist, but that they're sort of seen as pseudoscience for the most part, and there's not good evidence of them. Um, looking at the backfire effect in psychology, which is really interesting, this is the idea that uh, the more you use evidence and logic to persuade somebody of something, oftentimes the more they will resist, resist it. So you see this with like flat earth, for example. Um, you cannot convince a flat earther to agree that the earth is round by presenting them with you know, the centuries and centuries of scientific evidence that is absolutely clear and and, and correct uh, to persuade them otherwise, right? Everything you say, they will find some way to like try and argue around it or get around it. Um, and they just dig their heels in further. So it's really interesting, the backfire effect in psychology. Um, age restricted, yeah, because there's curse words in this. So we're going to do this uh, in class on Thursday. We'll watch John Oliver. We'll talk about scientific studies and research ethics. We'll sort of like talk about how the, the science of science, right? We'll talk about a little bit more about how science is conducted, problems with the scientific practice, um, problems with scientific reporting. We'll have a discussion after we watch this video. And we will also watch um, part of a documentary called Creating Freedom, The Lottery of Birth on the Stanley Milgram obedience experiments, the shock experiments. You may be familiar with these. They're some of the most famous experiments in social psychology. Um, but I'll show you part of this documentary in class, and then we will talk about research ethics. Um, we'll talk about deception. We'll talk about all this, this fun sort of stuff. If you're not coming to class on Thursday, um, you can YouTube, Google or on YouTube find actual footage of the Milgram experiments like follow this link here through the slide. It's pretty interesting. The documentary is one I bought, so I can't, I can't show you if you're not in class. Um, and think about these questions, right? So to conclude, in order to explain reality, you have to collect good data about reality. That's what this 
PowerPoint presentation was intended to get you to think about how do you collect good data? Follow the scientific method as best you can, choose appropriate research methods, let the data speak for itself, right? Don't misinterpret your data, don't misrepresent your data. You want to be ethical, so don't be unethical. Don't be like that uh, anti-Planned Parenthood group. Don't be like political parties who ask really bad questions and then try to say that that's what people believe. Uh, what are some other examples of, of unethical behaviors we touched on? I think that might, might be about it, but there's a lot of really good examples, unfortunately, of unethical research, whether it's Volkswagen testing exhaust fumes on monkeys by putting uh, masks on the monkeys. The monkeys are in cages behind the diesel engines that run Volkswagen cars and the masks are connected straight to the diesel engine. So the monkey is inhaling the fumes. Um, that was an unethical study that was nonetheless uh, passed by a university IRB panel. Um, but Volkswagen got a lot, in a lot of trouble for that once that came out. Um, the Facebook manipulation, emotional manipulation study is another example of probably unethical research that hopefully wouldn't have made it through a university IRB panel, but Facebook is not a university. And so they did not have the same standards of research ethics, but essentially the findings were really interesting, but uh, they, they found that you can actually affect people's emotions by what appears on their Facebook feeds, which is kind of scary. Um, you know, we, we don't want to be made sad or angry or anything like that because of what appears on our feeds, but it turns out that if you have a lot of negativity on your feed, um, it is likely to decrease your, your happiness or your mood. Um, and if you have a lot of positive things on your feed, you're likely to be a little more happy or optimistic. So interesting findings, but they manipulated uh, a ton of people's Facebook feeds, maybe even mine. I have no idea because it's not public information. Uh, anyway. Um, this is for next next week and I'll let you know about this. So thanks for watching this video. I hope it was interesting. Um, I'll see whichever group is supposed to come to class on Thursday on Thursday. Um, here's a summary and there's all the optional stuff. Afterward. Enjoy. Have a good week.